Let's all bow our heads. <clears throat> our eternal Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly look to you this morning, uh, coming together in this place, Lord, uh, that we might have the opportunity to, to worship you today. And we thank you, Lord, for your, your, your goodness and your mercy towards each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who so willingly came uh, and, and laid the, the example for us, Lord, in how we ought to live. And uh, he was willing to give his life even to be that sacrifice for the sins of the world. And today, Lord, we, we want to come and praise and worship him uh, for the change that has taken place in each of our lives when we came to know Christ. And I pray today, Lord, that you would uh, bless my brother as he would open the service. I pray that your spirit would abide in this place, that it might fill each of our hearts this morning. Uh, Lord, that we might be fed from on high, that all that uh, spiritual food, Lord, that we could take, that we may be filled this morning. And uh, Lord, that we might uh, be comforted and encouraged and that we, Lord, too, might have the opportunity to, uh, to lift your name up and high, that we would praise you for your goodness. Uh, so, Lord, we pray that you would bless all that's said and done here this day that we might be able to receive your blessing, that our hearts might be open, that you would prepare them, Lord, even as we pray, to receive the words that would be given this day. Uh, bless all those who aren't with us, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would be with those who are, uh, have been fighting afflictions of this life and those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, even those, Lord, that were mentioned this morning. Uh, we look to you for all things. And we know, Lord, that you can take away uh, all of our pain and all of our tears and uh, you could heal their bodies and, uh, Lord, give them comfort and joy in their lives and peace. And I pray that you would bless them, whatever their needs may be today. Uh, be with us now, Lord, and throughout all that's done this day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I have to admit, I am really bad at keeping track of the kids' church schedule. Is there? Do we have children's church this week? I don't think so. Okay. There have been times when we've started speaking and then all the kids awkwardly look at me and get up and leave, so I wanted to check before we got started. So... So if you've been in our um, Sunday school the last few weeks, Brother Bob has been taking us through um, Third Nephi. Um, we started, I think, in the 15th chapter, or 16th chapter, and we've been touching on a lot of themes, but one of the things we've been talking about is um, what the church has received and what that means for our time and uh, what our calling is. And I was thinking about a, a lot of these things throughout uh, the last few weeks, and, and God put something on, on my mind um, and it kept coming back to me, and I dug into the scriptures a little bit, and I felt to to share today um, on this on this theme that he gave me, and it has to do with really who we are as the Church of Jesus Christ. And you know, we we have these conversations with individuals of of explaining, well, where do you go to church, and well, what does that mean, and what do you believe, and sometimes we have trouble really articulating, and. Um, you know, we, we understand that even in the world today, um, there are so many people that claim Christ, that claim Christianity, and really have a, a wide range of beliefs and um, understandings and, and how they worship God and, and trying to really dig deep of, you know, what is it about the Church of Jesus Christ that makes us different? And Forgive me, I'm going to pull out my phone. I, I wanted to start with this. I don't know if you've been to our website, but we have a really nice website um, for the church. It's thechurchofjesuschrist.org. And if you pull up our main website, the very first text that you will read, it says, Restored in truth, guided in spirit. 
So when you think about, you know, this is obviously uh, something that the, the leaders of the church came together and they discussed, you know, how are we going to present ourselves to the world? How can we so succinctly tell people what we're all about? And I think it's interesting. The very first word they use on our page is restored. Restored in truth, guided in spirit. And then the next little blurb on the, uh, the website, it says, At the Church of Jesus Christ, we believe in the simple, beautiful truth of the restored gospel. The gospel infused with the same love on which Christ has built his church. So I would say the, the leaders of the church have been pretty clear. We are restored in truth, and we believe in the beautiful truth of the restored gospel. So what I really wanted to focus on today is this idea of restoration. And what does that mean? And how do we use that? You'll hear certain people in the church talk about, well, the Church of Jesus Christ, we're, we're restorationists. So again, we're using this word to try and sum up how we're different than others. Um, so as I said, I, wanna, I have a couple pieces of scriptures that we'll look at, and I want you to really try to understand what this word means to us. Um, in this day and time, but also understand the consistency. Because we, we know that it's, you know, the, the gospel did not start in 1830. You know, God has worked with mankind from the beginning. And everything God does, He does consistently over and over and over. And if we look hard enough, we see the beauty and the simplicity of the gospel and His truth as He is consistent time and time again. So, you know, today I wanted to start with the, the first covenant. We kind of mentioned this in, in Sunday school today. And, you know, obviously we have the creation and, and, and God gives man this free will and, and be able to do what we choose. And um, you think of Adam and Eve. But when we really get to the relationship with God, many of us think about um, Abram and the covenant God made with him and, you know, changing his name to Abraham. And... There's a piece of scripture that I think summarizes it real well instead of going through Genesis and reading the whole story. Um, Nehemiah, he's um, speaking, actually he's in prayer, but he's, he's speaking um, to the people and giving them an understanding and he sums it up really nicely because in the, I'm in the ninth chapter, the seventh verse, it says, Thou art the Lord, uh, you, thou art the Lord, the God, who didst choose Abram and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gavest unto him the name Abraham and foundest his heart faithful before thee and madest a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites. So you're probably familiar with this story. God promised to Abraham that his, his, uh, his seed, his children, his, um, you know, the next generations, they would be a mighty people and that they would have their own land. And he led them to that land of Canaan. So God has established this promise. But the thing is, with mankind, we, we struggle. We think about the, the garden, uh, the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve, and how it was such a perfect scenario, and they, you know, they, had, they had one rule, right? Not to break, and they broke that rule. And uh, even with Abraham, you know, he was given this land and, um, for his children to inherit, and they were supposed to maintain it in um, worshiping God and keeping it pure. And they, they messed that up, too. And they allowed other gods and idols to come in and what happened is, as I'm sure you're, you're familiar, God took them out of that place. He led them to the land of Egypt. So they were, they were in Egypt for um, you know, a couple hundred years, and God used that time to purify them. And then continuing in this ninth chapter of Nehemiah, I was in the seventh verse, seventh and eighth, but if you skip down to the 24th verse, it says, so the children went in and possessed the land. So this is them coming out of the wilderness. So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduedest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands with their kings and their people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities and the fat of the land and possessed houses full of goods, wells digged, vineyards, uh, olive yards full of trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted in themselves in great goodness. 
So I know I'm, I'm summarizing a, a big story here, but we see this in the very first covenant God made with mankind, that they would have their own land, that once corruption came in, He had to separate them from that land. But then when the timing was right, He restored it to them. And restored it to them in such a nice way that when they came back to Canaan, the, the, the lands were plowed, the, the, the wells were digged, it says the houses were established, that it was perfect for them because another people had been inhabiting it, and God chased them out. So this is a, a, a physical example of restoration, of removing them from their own place and then bringing them back when they were ready, when their hearts were purified even in the wilderness. I want to give another physical example of, of restoration. And I, I know that we have all the kids upstairs today, so maybe we can get a little, little bit of interaction. If, I know they all got their heads down on, on things. And any, of, any of the kids, you guys, I know that you guys have asked for prayer before. Has anyone been healed before? Camden, what, what was your healing? Oh, thank God. Camden slammed her thumb in the door and, and she prayed and God healed her. Any, any of the other kids? Any other healings? Thought I saw another hand. Yeah, Jonah? I burned my hand. I remember that. That was a long time ago. It burned uh, both, both hands, right? <laughs> yeah, really badly. And um, yeah, we, we prayed and He's got full use, no scars, thank God. And so you, you think about that. We, we, we understand that life is for a, um, a short period of time, and it's even referred to as a probate period, that there is a time that our natural life will come to an end. That is the plan of God. Why would God heal us when we get sick, when we get hurt, when we get injured? I mean, He loves us, and He has the ability to heal. But why would He heal? Our, uh, our teachers had brought us through a lesson where we, we were looking at all the, um, the miracles of, of Christ. And, um, you know, they rehearsed how God did these, these healings, you know, giving uh, sight to the blind or raising the dead. But we spent so much of those classes understanding what that meant to us and what it was teaching us. I think this is another beautiful example of restoration. I think it's showing God how, God's showing us how He can take something that's, that's hurt, that's broken, that's injured, and He has the power to make it whole once again. Because it's not really that important during these few years if, if we have a scar in our hand or if our thumb doesn't quite work the same way. But I think God does these things to teach us lessons to remind us that what is once broken or corrupted, He has the power to restore. And we think about that through the, the life of Christ. You know, we read about the miracles and there was many other miracles that were done, but that, that restoration power of giving strength to the lame, giving sight to the blind, even life to the dead, which He did on multiple occasions, we think of the, the widow's son. We think of Lazarus. We think of, um, you know, uh, Jairus' daughter. You know, situations where naturally there, there was no life and he gave life back. He's showing us something. He's helping us to understand how he works. And that's just the natural and you think about the spiritual, and, and, and for me, I mean, I think about my life, and um, God, is, God has healed me physically at times. But the spiritual healing that He placed within me is greater than any physical healing I have ever experienced. Um, you know, I, I had uh, spinal meningitis um, as a, a very, very small toddler and have zero effects from that. I had a tumor in my eye that the doctor said, there's nothing we can do other than remove the eye. And uh, I, I still have both eyes. Um, I have many examples of how God has touched me and saved me. But spiritually, what He's done for me to give me a new heart, to change my perspective on life, is completely different. 
And if you want to understand how that connects to restoration, look at our kids. You know, when, I, when I look at my daughter and she gets excited because I walk in a room, that, that level of joy, you know, that's something we lose as we get older and we deal with trials of life. But when God touches us, when we come to an understanding of how much He loves us and how He sent His Son for us and how unworthy we are, but He'll fill our heart with joy, we can be restored to some of that, that innocence. That's why we're commanded to be like child, to be childlike. And um, there's, you know, when, once we make that uh, commitment, there's a piece of scripture I'll, I want to turn to in the 40th chapter of Alma. But again, the, the idea of this, this spiritual and natural restoration that goes on as we interact with the Lord, um, it's the, excuse me, the 40th chapter of Alma, and he's talking about when this life comes to an end. And it says in the 23rd verse, the soul shall be restored to the body, and the body to the soul. Yea, and every limb, joint, shall be restored unto its body. Yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost, but all things shall be restored to the proper and perfect frame. And now, my son, this is the restoration of which has been spoken by the mouths of the prophets. And then shall the righteous shine forth in the kingdom of God. So again, you want to talk about the consistency of the Lord. Restoring us physically. Restoring us to our lands. Restoring our, our likeness of our heart and our, our, um, our joy. And here it's talking about even the restoration of the body and soul unto a perfect state. That is what we're looking forward to. That is what we're hoping for. That all these promises would be fulfilled and the covenant that we've made with God would all come together. And up to this point, you know, I've, I've been reading through here, I would say most people that claim Christ believe this. They believe all these things we've been talking about. They, they have faith in uh, what God, how God he interacted with Abraham, um, how we find salvation through Jesus Christ. And in Sunday school, we were talking about how sometimes we, the, the Christian world draws a line. And it's like, I'll take all of history up to me, and then I stop. But in the Church of Jesus Christ, we understand that it continues beyond that. And we can continue to see this consistency of restoration. And I want, I want to continue. I'm not going to, to read, but just to paraphrase, if you go to the first, cha or first Nephi, the 13th chapter, it talks about the apostasy and restoration. It talks about how it's not pleasing to God that there are so many different churches that are worshiping Him so many different ways. That the gospel came forth from Jesus Christ directly to people, that He had a ministry to look unto Him. And in, within a short period of time, there were, there were people that were making baptism not a, a choice, something that people were not doing voluntarily. Uh, people that were claiming Christ and telling you to pray to idols, to statues. We see that there was a corruption that came in, an apostasy, that this is not what the Lord wanted for His people. And He took His Spirit away. And you read through that 13th chapter, and it talks about how God reestablished that with truth with those plain and precious parts that were missing through a restoration. Not something new, but to restore what He gave us initially. That truth, the beauty of the Gospel. Even the coming forth in the Book of Mormon, that we could read these words, that we can read in the Book of Mormon, and we can read in the Bible, and we can see how they're one, and they work together, and they give us a perfect understanding that His church would be restored. That the priesthood authority would be restored. The same way our body and soul will be restored. The same way Israel was restored to Canaan. The same way the Lord restored uh, movement in Camden's thumb. It's a consistency of how God loves His people and He works with them. And I'm going to go to one last scripture and then I'll give way to my brother. So we've been talking about this, this idea of restoration. 
and how it applies to us and we see how it's, uh, God has worked with His people in the past and I want to look to the future now. And a brother Bob challenged us to, to question how does this apply to us today in Sunday school? And I want to go to the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. So uh, the Lord is having this interaction with the prophet Ezekiel and he's writing down this vision that he has. And starting in the first verse, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, they were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. So obviously this is a vision that God is giving to Ezekiel so we understand that there's got to be some spiritual significance to this. And when you think about being close to the Lord, it talks about being on the mountain of the Lord, about being on the hilltops. But in this vision, he was given to understand that he was in a very low valley. So we can equate that to being far from God. And we see these bones and it says that they were very dry, not just dry, but very dry. So we see that there's a separation there, a separation of life, a separation of spirit. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto those, these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So we're seeing a, another physical example of restoration, taking dry bones to give life to them, but we understand that, again, a spiritual significance. He says, I'm going to do these things and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And the seventh verse, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon uh, them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. There was the natural restoration, but there was no breath. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold my people, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come up from your graves and bring you unto the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And ye shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. And I shall place in you your own land when ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So the example that I started with today of that promised land for Abraham and all of his children the nation of Israel, we read here, and it's talking about the fulfilling of that, the coming back to that. We understand there's a lot that happens in between, and this is what the Lord is giving Ezekiel to understand. That there will come a time that Israel will be like these dry bones, that there will be no spiritual life, there will be no spiritual understanding. There's times when Israel will believe that they're going to connect to God by sitting around in a sweat hut. That they're going to connect with God by making sacrifices. That they're going to connect with God by forcing other nationalities out of their country. But that's not how they're going to connect with the Lord. 
This is an example of restoration. Restoring the promises that God has given to mankind from His very first covenant. And it's important to understand this because our hope as Gentiles, our hope is that we would be included in their promises. So we should understand those promises. And as we read about where we are in this day and time, in these latter days, we're in this story. There can be debate of what verse we're on, but we're in this story. And the bones are shaking, and they're rattling, and there's skin coming upon them. And there are lost tribes that are claiming Israel. They're not gathered together as an army yet, but we see this coming about. And as we continue to read in Ezekiel, just in case we don't understand how this is coming about, just in case you, you talk to someone and they say, well, that's not really what that means. That's not talking about the latter days. That's not connected to any type of record you have of Joseph. <clears throat> Let me continue in the 15th verse. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and ride upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and ride upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all of his house, of all that house of Israel, his companions, and join them one another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou show us what thou meanest by this? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand, and the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand, both before thine eyes. <coughs> the record of Judah and the record of Joseph the Bible, and the Book of Mormon. The coming together of these two tools will signify this, this restoration that we're reading about. Because we are the Church of Jesus Christ. We are restorationists. We believe in the restored gospel, which is consistent with God. This is a message He's been trying to teach His people from the very beginning that He makes promises and He gives us blessings and He puts beautiful things in our lives. And as mankind, we screw it up. We make mistakes. But our God loves us and He wants to restore us. And when we're far, far from Him, like in the valley, or when we feel like we don't feel His Spirit with us, He's willing to restore us and bring us back to Him. That is the consistency of God. That is the message that He has given to the Gentiles in this day and time. That we would even be a part of this. Because we've joined these records together. We're studying the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And we're waiting for God to move His hand. And the exciting thing is, we're starting to see His hand move. So I'm going to give way to my brother, but I, I would ask that you would think about this. You know, there are certain phrases we use in the church that we throw around, and maybe we, we become a little too comfortable with that, and we don't think about the real significance of what that means. When you claim to be part of the church of Jesus Christ, restored in truth and in spirit, that we would have the authority given to us of God, restored in the latter days, that we would be part of the working of God to restore Israel as the people of God. It's the consistency of the Lord. It's the privilege that we have to be part of this church in this day and time. May God bless you. Let's turn to 27 in the Songs of Zion.
to add a few thoughts today. Uh, I called that song, uh, you know, it doesn't have the word restoration in it, or wasn't, you know, that wasn't the theme of the song we just sang, but uh, when I think of the restoration and how it's changed my life, the effect it's had on me and my family um, and all of you, I, I'm thankful for that. It makes me want to sing. And praise God for uh, the knowledge that we have, the understanding that we have in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I, I enjoyed the message this morning. Uh, I'm truly thankful for that restoration that's taken place, um, that, that spiritual restoration within our own lives, in our own heart, and uh, the restoration of the church and the gospel of Christ. I was thinking, as our brother was speaking, um, anytime I, I think of rest, you know, restoration or restoring of something, it reminds me of when I was in high school and uh, we were working at the Tasty Freeze. There's quite a few of us from the branch that, that worked there. And every summer they'd have a cool cruise, they would call it. It's, uh, if you've ever been to one of those, it's a, a, a car show where people bring their old vehicles in and they, they park them in the lot and they show them off. And most all the cars are, are old classic cars, 50s, 60s, 70s. Those were the cars that I, that, that I, I kind of like to look at. But uh, the same was, you know, it was the same for everybody that brought one. It wasn't that they brought in their old 50-year-old car full of holes and rust and dents, but it was, it was the old classic car that they had restored to make it look brand new. And, and I was a fan of, of looking at those vehicles. And uh, I enjoyed to see the beauty of, of vehicles from that, that time period. You know, they looked a lot different back then. They, were, um, they sounded a lot different back then than the cars that they make today. And, and it was important that the people... You know, the guys who were really into that, that they would find the exact parts they need made, you know, from the same year, you know, same make and model that would fit perfect. And it would be the original parts that would, you know, really make the car 
exactly what it was when it was came off the assembly line years ago and and that was that's what you know restoring a vehicle is it's restoring it to its original uh you know custom make and and look and design and when we think of the restoration of the gospel it, it's restoring that gospel to to its original form Everything about the gospel that we, we have today, we pray that it's a, the way that Christ had established it when he set up the church, that his examples and his, his way of, uh, of, of teaching the ordinances and so forth that he set up, they'd be done a certain way. And we pray that we're, we're doing that even in this day and time as the church of Jesus Christ. And um, I want to read a, a verse from Numbers chapter 10. And this is when uh, the Lord was speaking to Moses. And they were giving commandments and he was given the law and so forth. And um, we read about their, their travels during these chapters and what was going on as they were um, approaching the promised land. And the Lord told Moses to make two trumpets out of silver. It says, Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the, uh, of the camps. And I heard a brother recently speak uh, regarding this chapter. and um, There's something very important about why the trumpets were made from the same piece of silver. And some of you might know. But... When they make a trumpet out of the same material, that same piece of silver, that when they blow that trumpet, it'll sound exactly the same. There'll be no difference between the sounds of, of the two horns when you, when you play them. And it says that they were given instruction that they shall blow them. Um, it says, All the assembly shall assemble themselves uh, to thee at the door of the tabern tabernacle of the congregation. And it gave some instructions about blowing these, these trumpets, about uh, when to, to use them as they would travel along in, in, in order to, to gather the people together at times. It says that the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And it says, And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. And even as the, the children of Israel had these trumpets that would sound each time they would come to, to maybe battle a group of people, it says that the Lord remembered them when he heard those trumpets, when, this, when, the, when the sound was made. And uh, today you can liken that to the, to the words that we have. Our brothers just read the scriptures about those, uh, those two sticks that shall be combined and, and be one in thine hand. And we have these two records to, that we, we read from, that we study from, that we preach from today in the church of Jesus Christ. And if you read them, they have the same sound, do they not? The gospel that you read in uh, this history, this book of Judah, is the same gospel and the sound that we read as uh, when we read the words of the history of Joseph here in the Book of Mormon. And we thank God for that. It's an incredible thing that, that we have this understanding and, and we can uh, thank God today that it's, it's been given to each of us. There's many people in the world that, that don't understand that, that aren't even interested in hearing that. There's people that might today, you know, they look at, the, at the, the record that we have of Joseph, the Book of Mormon, and they just want nothing to do with it. The, the name is enough to, to scare them away. But if, if you open the, the book and you read the words, and you feel the spirit that... Is, is given through those words and how it's just a confirmation of all things that we read in, in, in throughout the Bible. It's truly uh, one of the greatest blessings that's ever been given uh, to mankind. And we thank God today that uh, there were those who came before us that uh, held on to the gospel, that lifted it up, that shared the gospel, that we might have the opportunity today 
to even be part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, so I'm truly thankful for that. I wanted to um, read another scripture. I believe you were in the 15th chapter of 1 Nephi. But, um, there's a verse in there I really like. As Nephi is giving this explanation uh, to his brothers who were complaining, they didn't have an understanding of, of um, the visions that their father was given. And it says that they, uh, they were disputing between one another about what the things all meant. And Nephi's response was, was perfect to them. As he was trying to explain it to them, it says, this, They said to him, We cannot understand the words which our father hath spoken concerning the natural branches of the olive tree and also concerning the Gentiles. And so they, they didn't understand the, the future that was a, a, you know, for their family. The future that was given to their father in this vision. And understanding that we have clearly now with the scriptures um, that we hold before us. But they, had this, they didn't have an understanding of it. And Nephi's response was perfect to them. He said, have ye inquired of the Lord? You know, sometimes we just try to answer all of life's questions on our own. We're, so we, we try to figure it out. And then if we don't understand, it's easy to just complain. Well, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not sure, you know, I, I, I believe this or that. You know, people might, um, when, they, when they hear about what we believe in, when you mention the Book of Mormon, it might be one of those, those things where people say, well, I don't understand that. You know, uh, how come the rest of the world doesn't know that? How come it hasn't been, you know, how come more people don't believe in that and so forth? Lots of questions that can come up. But the, the question we, we all need to ask ourselves is, have we inquired of the Lord? Have we asked the Lord for direction? Has he, have, have we looked to Him that He would open our hearts and our minds to understand the truths of the gospel that our brother read to us and shared some of those things with us this morning? And uh, they said they did not. It was, they, they had not asked the Lord. And then Nephi's response was, How is it that ye do not keep the commandments of the Lord? How is it that ye will perish because the hardness of your hearts? It says, do you, he said, Do you remember the things which the Lord hath said? If ye will not harden your hearts and ask me in faith, believing ye shall receive, with diligence and keeping the commandments, surely these things shall be made known unto you. So Christ had said that if we have any concerns or questions, any doubts, if we look to Him in faith, that He will open our eyes to the answers to, of, of all of life's questions, all of the concerns we have. And in regards to the restoration, I, 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 you're all here this morning. And so I know that that is something that is not a question in your minds. But we may have other questions in this life. You know, the, the things that decisions, big decisions to make about, uh, you know, work or our health or our family. And, but the Lord is able to answer all of those things. The future of this people was important to the Lord. And our future is important to the Lord. All parts of it. And so may we continue to look to the Lord that He would direct us. That we would be open to... Uh, his voice for the things that we stand in need of each and every day. And so um, we look forward to the future that uh, the church has, the, our role in this, uh, these latter days that we, we've read often and spoke often about from this rostrum. And uh, I, I pray there's an excitement about it for you. I pray that... Um, we would be drawing closer to the Lord every day. You know, we, we've seen changes and things in the world these last few years that are, you know, I, I see, I work with a lot of older people. A lot of, uh, a lot of patients that I see are, are older and, and have lived through various times and, and, and you know, uh, the, the things the country has seen in the last 70 or 80 years. And, and they all tell me the same thing. We have never seen anything like this. 
You know, they've never experienced anything like this. The world that we live in today is so different from the world they grew up in. And I, I believe that the Lord is, is giving us a, a period of time to prepare that we would draw closer to Him. Because we know that these promises that we heard about this morning, that, that we've read about, that the people were given regarding the, the future of Israel, the people of Joseph, all the tribes of Israel, we know what their future is, that there will be this gathering taking place, and we want to be a part of it. And so let's take this time to truly uh, prepare our hearts for what the future may hold. And, you know, there's, uh, things have changed dramatically, and I know many of the brothers that are, have been going out on missionary work, especially in this country, and working with the people that uh, we read about, their ancestors, that they're seeing changes happening at a rapid pace. And they could make the same statement. Things that they saw 30 years ago out in the field are, are way different than what they're seeing today as far as the people and their acceptance of Christ and their willingness to learn more and understand the gospel. We even heard recently of, uh, of a sister, well, she's not a sister, but uh, there's uh, a couple, I'm, I'm sure Brandon has met them out, out west, um, that she has been given understanding through the Spirit. Our brothers have been working with people out there and they're starting to recognize themselves as the people of, of Joseph, the people of Israel. And it's through the Spirit working among them. And so we praise God for that today. And we, we look forward to all that uh, our futures hold and we pray that we even might be able to be used, be part of that as part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if our, if our hearts are right and our, our minds are firm and we have our faith that's unshaken, the Lord will be able to use each of us that we might further His kingdom. So may God bless you today. Turn to uh, number 84 in the Songs of Zion.
we'll close this in prayer. Let's all just bow our heads. Dear, dear God, uh, and humbly come before you today, Lord. And dear God, we thank you for the words that were spoken, Lord. And dear God, we hope that uh, we can open our hearts and our minds to the words and, and put them to the use that you have uh, given us, Lord. Lord God, we, we know we uh, fall short many times, Lord, and we ask that you can be with us and lead, guide, and direct us in all that we do, Lord, so that uh, we can put your work first and uh, enjoy the spirit that you have given us. So be with us until we uh, meet again this afternoon, Lord. Watch over and protect all those that have asked for prayer, Lord, and be with the families that have lost loved ones, Lord, that they can feel your spirit among them. And dear God, we ask you to bless the food that is prepared downstairs, Lord, that uh, it can be a uh, nourishment to our bodies so that we can uh, fill our souls with your spirit this afternoon. To be with us as we go. And all this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.